Welcome to the Autosportradio.com 2017 show. I'm your host, Don Kay. We are live from McGilvery Speedway at 30th and High School in the beautiful town of Speedway, Indiana. We are brought to you tonight by Honda and Honda HPD, the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, and the Verizon IndyCar Series. First off, I've got to stop and thank a couple of my people without whom this wouldn't even have started today. My IT cracker, Jack Ted Howlett, was up helping me set up the last couple of days because i got a problem. I'm getting old, I guess. And uh, I appreciate all his help. And, of course, from Speedway Cable, uh, Brett Robinson came in and made a special trip, set up the equipment tonight so we could stream live, and here we are. Um, I also want to mention, if you haven't been to the Speedway Museum, you need to get there. I'm telling you, the people that have seen the uh, Foyt exhibit say it's absolutely spectacular. So get yourself over there, see it, and when you walk in, you'll see this smiley blonde there. Give her your $100 bill, and she'll let you take a tour of the place. <laughs> um, I, I need to introduce some visitors. We have some people from out of town, or even out of the state for that matter, sitting next to Sharon. Next to her is her daughter, Kim. They are here from, she's a, a, a career nurse in Palm Har in uh, Clearwater, Florida. And uh, th they have come up to visit their mom. And it, with her are her two kids, her daughter Chelsea and her son Zeke. Qu I mean, Courtney. What am I, Ch Chelsea? Courtney, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Zeke. It's Courtney. <laughs> uh, in case you have computer trouble, which I have a, a, a good thing for having, don't forget computer overdrive at Lynnhurst and Crawfordsville Road. They can fix it, and you want to be a pilot of a drone, Mark can help you there, too. Give them a call, 317-328-0766. <clears throat> now, my first guest is a guy that I'm surprised he talks to me. I've been chasing him for about four months, knowing full well he was busy. I'm not sure what he was doing, but we're going to find out. He has been uh, in motorsports for many years as, uh, as an engineer. He got Dale Coyne his first win with Justin Wilson at the wheel. He Worked with um, Gilles DeFerrin early in his career and gave him the option if instead of going to Formula One at the tail, why not come over to America and, and be the greatest driver in the world? And he did. I'm going to find out what got him started in this. It couldn't have been because it was better to do this and make sandwiches at uh, Burger King, I would assume. I'm pleased he's here. He is the Vice President of Competition and Racing Technology. Please welcome Mr. Bill Pappas. <laughs> what got you started in racing well that's a long story but i'll try to get it where you can uh, hear it all tonight <laughs> um my family originally was uh from chicago illinois great city great city and uh they moved to indianapolis in 1957 and they moved into a neighborhood full of locals and uh they started uh, hanging out with these these folks and uh, a couple of the husbands told my dad you need to come out to this uh place they call the Indianapolis Motor Speedway and see a uh, most incredible afternoon of racing that you could ever imagine. So my dad went out and saw it and, you know, quickly became uh, hooked on it. Uh, in that neighborhood was uh, a gentleman that I believe was the president of Red Ball Moving and they sponsored Eddie Sachs. And, you know, in a very short time, my parents became uh, integrated into the fabric of, you know, the Indianapolis 500 in the month of May. And uh, as I grew, uh, you know, I have two older brothers. Each one of us kind of chose our hero. Mine was A.J. Foyt, as you talk about his uh, uh, exhibit there at the Speedway. Uh, A.J. was, you know, this bigger-than-life individual, did things his own way. Um, as a young kid, I'd go out to the Speedway, hang on the fence, and finally got up enough nerve to walk into the garage area with an empty box and told him it was for Mr. Foyt. The yellow shirts let me in. I stood at his garage door and uh, you know, he noticed me and asked me what I was doing there. And I just kind of shrugged my shoulders. He handed me a broom and said, start sweeping, boy. <laughs> so I, I swept his garage. And uh, you know, that was a very early age. And I just was passionate about uh, the 500, was passionate about racing. I had uh, friends whose, parent, whose fathers owned their own machine shop in the month of May, became very busy. And you'd go hang out with them. Uh, I had a neighbor that worked for Allison uh, Engineering, and in the summertime, he worked for Bruce McLaren and his Can Am program. And they'd have the car there in our neighborhood, so I'd go over there and sit on tires and clean stuff for those guys and watch that. 
and it just continued to evolve. I just, you know, was just taken by the speed, was taken by the the, the history, uh, you know, the, the place is such a great um, exhibition of, of engineering, and I just was fascinated by it. Uh, so I followed through, got a mechanical engineering degree from Purdue University, um, started my career in a different field, in the aeronautical engineering field, uh, but found myself bored. And, uh, you know, I'd go to races out on the West Coast. That's where I was living. I'd go to Riverside, went to the Phoenix races, and always find myself helping out Mr. Foyt. And, um, you know, about 1987, I was given an opportunity to actually engineer a car for Doug Shearson, his Indy Lights program, uh, with Calvin Fish driving the car. Um, he and I hit it off really well. We had immediate success. I recognized that I could do this and had a lot of fun at it. Um, it was interesting. My dad uh, always recognized very early that uh, this opportunity uh, satisfied two things in me. I was very competitive. I played football and basketball in high school and college. And uh, as an engineer, I love taking things apart, putting things together, drawing. So it, it really was the ultimate of here you are, you got a problem, resolve it. On Sunday, you go out and see if it's better than the other guys. If not, you go back to the drawing board. And, uh, you know, so it was, it was a very satisfying move into auto racing. Um, haven't looked back since then. Now, I'm not surprised for you to say that in high school and college you played football and basketball. You're not the smallest guy in the, in the paddock, for sure. But you had just the athletic prowess to play it. That wasn't really trip your trigger, obviously. Uh, again, I, I, I continued to play until I got hurt and was taken out due to uh, physical issues. Now, you know, the, the, the cars of today, now we'll get to the new one, but cars of today, you're an engineer. You like to look at things and how can I tweak it? Are there any areas on the car where an engineer can modify something to, without telling the entire world or having everybody else be able to do the same thing? Well... We've, we've obviously created a formula that is economically driven to try to, you know, build our field back up. Um, we've tried to restrict that all-out uh, arms war, as I call it, uh, where the teams that have the most money can spend, you know, millions of dollars working on different aer aerodynamics al alone. And we've tried to restrict that. But there's still areas... Uh, that I think the engineer, if he's really good, can fine-tune the car. And those are the guys that are successful week in and week out. I mean, the tire is such an important part of the, the, the equation, and the guys work really hard figuring out, you know, what alignment the tire needs uh, to give you, you know, ultimate speed and, and pace for an entire stint. So there's a lot of engineering still going on. Now, when uh, Mr. Fry announced, that's Jay Fry, the president of the IndyCar Series, came up, they decided, and maybe it was a, a board meeting of all of you, that you're going to have a new car hit the track for 2018. What was that process like? Did he say, well, all right, guys, give me an idea, or did you guys come up with a plan? I know he said that you looked at the older cars from years back and then looking up to advance and put the whole package together. Well... It, it was obviously a group uh, effort. Uh, the big thing was is we're trying to entice you know more manufacturers to be involved. And first thing you got to understand is this aerodynamic package that we've been using the last two years costs several million dollars for Honda and Chevrolet to develop. And if you're asking another manufacturer to get involved, it's not just building an engine, which is several million dollars, but then he'd have to develop an aerodynamic package. And we just didn't see that as a feasible way to go forward. And with that, you know, we came up with the concept that we would freeze uh, the development after the end of last year, 2016, to run through 2017. And then through 2017, the group of us, you know, came up with, okay, what do we need to improve this car? Uh, there were a lot of concerns when the DW12 came out. Um, we sat down, put them on paper. We says, okay, we need to address that from a safety perspective. Then we sat down and looked at the car itself, and there was a lot of 
negative uh, comments through the DW12 and into the aero kit uh, look as far as people are going, this doesn't look like an Indy car. And uh, again, we sat down and started talking about it and came up with a general concept of how the car needed to look. And in, in doing that also uh, to incorporate these safety items, um, you know, aerodynamic uh, package that's, that works differently than the current um, aero kit cars. So we just kind of like systematically stepped through this. And we had a great partner in uh, Delara. They, they worked hand in hand with us. Um, we spent a lot of time going back and forth to Italy, spent a lot of time in the Delara wind tunnel, um, going through, okay, does this work? You know, air, a, win, um, a wing package, no, that didn't work. So we just kept systematically stepping through to come up with the, car, the design and the car that we ended up with. I know you said Tito Billy, uh, one of your team, spent uh, six trips over, over to Delara working on it. And the thing that I found interesting, the first time, I think it was the first time Jay was here, and we talked about wanting a new car, and, and he said one of the things he didn't like was the rear bumper, the rear fender. That's gone. He didn't like the aero package. That's gone. He wanted to make it where it wouldn't cost an engine manufacturer, you know, millions to design the aero package. So he got rid of that and is doing everything to get other manufacturers uh, on board with the team. Plus, obviously, you get a car that's going to run and last. Uh, you should get some new teams come in. I think that's important to get some more comp competition joining. I absolutely. You know, every every. Every day we're trying to, to uh, entice other team, other uh, spec racing teams to come race with us here in the IndyCar series. Uh, we have a couple Indy Lights teams that look like they're, they're wanting to step up. Um, you know, we want to build the field. We need to get back to where you got a good solid 12 owners and, you know, 24 to 28 cars racing every weekend. Somebody asked me. Hey, you know, when they have a problem, guy goes off course or spins and kills the engine, why don't they have a starter on the car? Um, we've talked about that time and time again. Um, there's a lot more involved as far as packaging. You know, we really have a very restricted area of where we can put something like that. So, you know, don't, don't go off the racetrack and don't stall it. <laughs> <laughs> well, now there's a clever thought. I wonder if anybody thought of that. Um, another interesting thing I found, and I've commented on this before, and when Jay was here I said the same thing the last time or a few weeks ago, that when the DW12 came out, I was out for their first test at the Speedway, and my first question before it hit the track was, are you sure this car is going to run? And they said, oh, the computer says it's going to be like a rocket. Well, I got news for you. It wasn't a rocket. And when I mentioned that to Jay, and he said, uh, no technology has ever driven a car. We are wind tunnel, so we know when we put the package together, it's going to run. And when you debuted on the 25th of, of uh, July, it did. Yeah, we were very proud of that. Uh, obviously, we were very aware of uh, the, the downfalls of the DW12. So through our course of uh, wind tunnel studies, uh, we back-to-back -back our present model uh, with the the other two models that are competing right now and just wanted to make sure that you know the numbers we were getting were real so we didn't have any surprises when he showed up over at the speedway and then you went from the speedway over to uh, mid ohio and tested and how did that go uh perfect we were we we're extremely happy with the results the drivers got out of the car and said that they were finally drivers again uh, they had a lot of fun i worked with juan when he won the 500 and 2000 and he reminded me of that one. You know, he, he got out and he says, this is fun. He goes, this will be a lot of, this will be a great car to race. Well, I think you took a lot of the, the wing out of the rear and the front to some degree and put the downforce under the car, which eliminates a lot of the air. And now puts the car more or less back into the driver's hands. Yeah, exactly. Uh, we did reduce the total, um, total amount of downforce in the car, but the big thing that was going on with the aero kit cars is they created a lot of turbulence. They had little winglets on the, the what we call the wheel guards, the, the devices behind the rear wheels. Um, the rear wing, the way it was located, created a lot of turbulence. So it made it difficult for the cars to drive close. Um, so we went back to old school. We, we put the underwing back in where it's the majority of the downforce. 
Um, again, getting rid of all those winglets and all those parts that are on top of the car. There's a little bit cleaner air behind them so the guys can drive closer and it should create some, some really exciting racing. And I got to think, yeah. And I got to think that the uh, Homatro safety team thanks you too because there isn't all those parts and pieces that'll be exploding all over the track. Yeah, that was that was a, another item on our list that uh, Jay was pretty adamant about. He says, you know, we got to like make sure we don't have shrapnel everywhere. So, uh, and getting rid of the wheel guards and the little winglets, and um, you know, you got to give Honda and Chevy a lot of credit for the product they produced. You know, they went out and and did some serious engineering and those parts were as light as they possibly could be and that's why when they come apart they come apart in a lot of pieces but uh, he was definitely adamant that we needed to reduce that. Now there's a car, the, the original idea of the car is, oh, as it's evolved over the years is when it hits a wall it's side pod and things are supposed to absorb the impact and dissipate the crush. What have you done to improve that? Well, again, the DW12 had had the radiators mounted basically behind the driver's hips, uh, angling toward the back of the car. Um, first thing we thought of is using the, the radiators as, as a crush structure. Um, it's not 100%, but it, it, it does create some, uh, some level of safety for the driver. But the next biggest thing was we created an actual crush structure that went around that, that ties into the front bulkhead uh, by the dash and the rear bulkhead behind the driver. And the idea of that is, is if they get into a side impact that the energy will then be distributed at those two angles and you know not crush into the side of the car and, and causing problems like uh, what Sebastian Bourdais experienced and what Justin Wilson experienced at Fontana. You know, there's been a handful of them due to that lack of uh, structure there beside the driver. Are you guys looking at uh, incorporating in the next year, two, three, a, a halo? <laughs> That's out there. Uh, we are looking at more of a, we call it a, a aero shield um, that uh, would be like a windscreen in front of the driver. Um, we think that with that, it provides a little bit more safety as far as parts flying you know, directly at the driver. Uh, what was it, uh, Felipe Massa who got hit in the head with a spring. You know, I don't think a halo would have stopped that. Uh, the aero screen would be probably much better for protecting the driver from that. Uh, the big thing with this project is we don't want to hurry it into, into production and, and do something that may not be right. You know, we're, we're systematically working through the, the problems that this, this uh, presents. You know, there's problems with visibility, with uh, distortion. Um, with mounting the, the, the screen to the car. So we're working very, very hard to ensure that when we do introduce it, that it'll be a safety item rather than a, a risk. And the, and the sad part is the injuries that happen are one in a million to happen, like Justin Wilson. You know, how could that happen? But then when you look at uh, how Sebastian Bourdais hit, the fact that he can walk is amazing, that the car obviously structurally sound in the safety barrier plus the safer barrier helps as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think the safer barrier has been probably the greatest innovation in racing. And we're very thankful that uh, the Speedway and, and the IRL were instrumental in, in developing that. And it's pr basically used on all oval types of racing now. And, uh, you know, it was a big part of saving him from uh, sustaining much more injuries than he did. What, uh, when you started your career and, and Mr. Foyt said, come on in, boy, get a broom and start to, did you have any thought that you would be at this position now as the vice president of competition and race engineering for a, a major series in the world of open wheel racing? Never thought of it. Never, never even came across my mind. Uh, again, you know, my, my passion had always been competing and, uh, you know, I, I just wanted to go out and race every week. It didn't matter whether it was, you know, you know, obviously Indy holds an incredible uh, um, place in my heart, but I, I just love going racing, and I have done it for basically the last 33 years. 
did you ever fit into a car? No, that's <laughs> unfortunately, that's never happened. Really? Yeah. What, you were too big or the car was too small? The car was too small. Oh, that's what I thought, okay. Um, what's the biggest satisfaction you get now in what you're doing? Right now, it's seeing that uh, we're building something for the future. Um, I think the series has turned a corner. I think uh, really great uh, days are ahead of us, um, and it's very exciting to be part of the planning and um, um, implementation of the cars, of new races, new racing teams. It's, it's exciting to see it grow. You know, I, I, I'm amazed. If, if For those of you who read, uh, I believe it was Sunday's paper, and I think it was in the business section, if I'm not mistaken, about the Pan Am Games and the young man who was ahead of that. Strangely enough, his name was, uh, what is it, Mark Miles. Mark Miles. At the age of 30. Yeah. And there was some talk about Cuba boycotting and all kinds of nonsense, so he packed up and they went down there. And they had some meetings and to get them to come up here, although it wasn't a good idea because their boxers always won and their baseball teams always whipped everybody. But he went down and he said the last night they were there, they are getting ready to leave, and there was a knock on the door when there's a meeting, and they went up to a conference room, and there was Fidel. Hmm. And he got to meet with him. In fact, I think he still he showed him holding a box of cigars. I think he still got a few of them. Is that right? But you know, the interesting thing I think is, you know, what did he know about the Pan Am games? Probably not much. I mean, he's a tennis player. Yeah. Uh, he he headed up the Super Bowl, which is probably the most successful one in the history of the Super Bowl. Now he's running one of the major motorsports uh, series in the world. And he knows how to put the right people in the right job, is my opinion. And I think, Jay, I think Jay's doing a great job, and I think the people he's brought in and the people that Mark brought in are really working well and going to put something on the track that's going to get people go, holy smoke, this is good, ain't it? Yeah, I, I mean, I think you hit it on the head. Uh, he, he's, he's really good at recognizing talent. And, uh, again, hiring Jay is a huge step in that direction. Jay's, you know, he's a great boss. I'm, I've been very excited coming here and each day, you know, working with him and, and dealing with him. You know, I really, really enjoy it. And I think he recognizes the, what he's, what he's trying to present here. He recognizes how important IndyCar racing is. And, um, you know, he's not taking any of it lightly. He wants to make it the best racing in the world, not just in the United States again. The interesting thing is he, he understands more than anybody that had been here prior, I think, as a team owner. He was involved in it from the start and worked his way up to the top in that and understands what it takes to go and what you know, what you can and cannot afford to do to get people into race. Plus, the thing I like about it is when he was here that one time, I said one of the other things I don't like is we need some more O's. Well, he's managed to add a couple. And, of course, the next event up is Gateway and the track – you were down there for the test. How did that go? Yeah, it was incredible. Uh, the gentleman that's now the owner of the, the racetrack, we tested last fall, and, uh, you know, the track really hadn't been um, taken care of, you know, to the level that we need the track specification to be at. Uh, they made an attempt to improve it over the winter. We went back in the springtime and still had the same problems. And he basically told Jay, tell me what you want me to do, and I'll do it. And, uh, you know, we told him, well, the corners probably need to be repaved. He goes, well, I'll just repave the whole racetrack. And he went out and repaved the whole racetrack. It was only another 11 bucks. What's the big deal? <laughs> Pocket change. Yeah. But uh, when Charlie Kimball made the first ride around the new surface in a, in a street machine, said, wow. And then when the guys tested Elio's brilliant comment was that the track is as smooth as a baby's bottom. That's good to hear that he knows <laughs> what a baby's bottom feels like. <laughs> I guess that's good. Um, do you have a, a specific type of race? Do you like street courses? you like road racing? you like ovals? I like the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. <laughs> so you had to go find a job where you can get in the gate free, is that it? <laughs> <laughs> something like that. Yeah, there you go. It's a very strange feeling. It is. You know, there's something about that place. I, I've lived up here, what, 24, 25 years, and I've been coming here for almost 60 years, or maybe it's more than 60. And I drive by the track, and I still get, ooh. There's something about it. Her, 
one of her granddaughters came up and ran the uh, mini marathon. And of course, part of the track is you under the yeah. gate, run around. She got done, and I said, "What do you think? That's the biggest thing I've ever seen. Yeah. You don't realize how big it is until you get in there. Yeah. It's enormous. Good yeah. grief!" Well, there's an interesting picture that floats around the internet, you know, frequently about what fits inside the, the grounds. And I mean, it's. I think they stuck the Colosseum, the Vatican, uh, Churchill Downs, the Rose Bowl, the White House grounds. I'm sure I'm missing two things or three things. Taj Mahal. Taj Mahal. Yeah. yeah, inside it. And it's, it's just amazing. And then they have another one that's out that shows all 12 Big Ten stadiums fit inside it. I mean, it's massive. Oh. And, uh, you know, they've done a great job. I mean, it's lasted two world wars, and, uh, you know, it's something special. There, there is something special about it. And I don't know what it is, but I can feel it when I drive by. And I, I love it. Yeah. I mean, I, I should have packed up and given up this a long time ago, but I love racing. I love the people in it. I think, as I've said many times, the ultimate sport of any is motorsport. Right. Because if, if your crew doesn't do everything right, you can pull out of the pit area and your wheel can fall off, or it can fall off when you get going down the back stretch and something can happen. So everybody's got to do their job, and they've got to do it right, and the driver's got to have the confidence that you did do it right. And then you can win races. Yeah, that's, that's a big uh, big uh, group of what-ifs. And, you know, to put it all together, that, that's a special to special moment. What's your, the biggest win that you had as, as, a, as a chief uh, engineer? Again, obviously, I, I won the Indy 500 with Juan Montoya. Um, that was, you know, lifelong dream. Um, very exciting. Um, but there have been a couple. I mean, winning Dale Coyne's first race, the guy had been racing for 25 years, never won a race, you know, really was never competitive. Um, and, you know, he gets two, two, two tall drinks of water together, and we hit it off really well. Uh, I can't say enough about Justin Wilson. You know, talk about the ultimate professional, uh, ultimate gentleman. This guy had it all. And to win at Watkins Glen, which is a very historic racetrack, was a very emotional uh, time for, for myself. Um, they have a very cool uh, tradition there. Uh, the winner of the race goes out to um, the Seneca Lodge. Seneca Lake Lodge. And uh, the, the way it goes is you carry out the laurel wreath, which has been the same uh, wreath that they put around the driver's uh, neck since they raced in the streets of Watkins Glen. And the driver goes out there and hangs it on this big ugly deer's head over the bar and the sad thing is is since IndyCar had been going there the winners none of them had gone there and so I'm standing in victory lane and there's Justin with the wreath around his neck and this this very kind woman comes up to me and she goes excuse me you know obviously you're with the racing team I said yes I am she explained the tradition and asked if you know I had any chance that we could get the driver to do this I said absolutely traditions everything in racing you know from drinking milk you know to this and we went out there and not only did we bring the wreath but we brought the uh, the trophy and they filled it up with cha champagne and we had a party <laughs> so that that was a very satisfying event now did you have anything to do with those 11,000 arrows that are shot in there uh, we might have <laughs> It got late. <laughs> yeah, I was there. And, you know, the thing that impressed me about the win, as you said, Dale had, had been racing for 25 years and had won. When, they came, when Justin came down, everybody was out to greet yeah. him. Yeah. No, again, I mean, I think it was uh, the ultimate win for the series. A guy who had been the underdog for so long. I remember racing against him um, back in the 80s, and he'd have a stock block engine, and between sessions he's changing um, – um, bearings in the bottom end of his engine and here's this guy you know he's just this little I keep trying guy and uh, Justin's story is amazing this guy sold shares in himself so he could go racing you know that's how committed he was to, to racing and uh, you know all of a sudden the, the stars aligned uh, you know Dale's looking for a driver Justin was looking for a drive I was looking for a job <laughs> And, uh, you know, the three of us hit it off really well, and uh, it was a great combination. Well, whatever you left behind when you departed has hung on, because suddenly...
Dale Coyne's a name to contend with. Yeah, I'm very proud of that because uh, you know, I'd like to think that the model that we, we kind of started there with him has been what's taken root there now. I mean, he's, he went out and hired Sebastian, who I think I got to work with him for a year. I think Sebastian's one of the premier drivers in, in the world. He's a, not only an incredible driver, but he's an incredibly special guy. And, uh, you know, he went out and got him, went out and hired some good uh, engineers. And, uh, you know, they're, they're going to be a team to be reckoned with next year. I think they got a great uh, steal in hiring Eddie Jones. I think he compliments Sebastian really well. Uh, I think he's only going to get better. You know, Sebastian's chomping at the bit to get back in the race car. Uh, I don't think he'll miss a step as soon as he does. And, uh, you know, I think Dale's he, he's, he's poised to be one of the, the premier teams, I think, going forward. Do you, uh, you know, the Mazda Road to Indy program has defined some outstanding young talent coming along. It's, it's sorry to see or sad to see it in some degrees that they struggle to find rides. There's some outstanding drivers out there that there's nowhere to go so it's time for some of these guys <laughs> to pack it in however having said that this guy he and aj or he and uh dick simon used to argue at, at, at the banquet every year who was older and i think when they quit i think Foyt was 55 and uh, simon was 56 or something like that so it seems they're saying well elio you're 42 he's got 10 more years to go yeah yeah i, I don't think we want to run them off i think we just need more teams uh, you know, I think Elio's a, a class act. You know, anytime he's on the racetrack, the guy's there to win. He's he's not a you know not there to just you know show up. He's there to win the race, and he, he showed that you know the last couple of weeks. Um, you know, Tony Kadan, he's another one. He just races these guys. You know, this is this is all they know, and I don't think we want to get rid of them. I think they're great ambassadors for our sport. I just think we need to encourage more teams. We've got to figure a way to grow the field and, you know, get the, the Juncos to move up to Indy cars, get, uh, you know, these other Indy Lights teams that are having great success to, to move up, uh, try to encourage sports car teams to come over and race with us. I, I, I just think that, uh, you know, we have a great uh, format for all these different teams and and sponsors and drivers and we just need to you know encourage them to come race with us well uh, if i could get in a car actually actually getting into the problem it's getting out getting out yeah i need too much grease and wax to get me the hell out of the car well i uh, appreciate everything you and your team have done uh and what you've developed i think uh uh, Jay laid out, I assume it was him, laid out the parameters that he wanted to see accomplished, and all of you sat down and, and uh, made it happen. Yeah, it's been a great team effort, and, and like I said, I'm very proud to be part of it and look forward to the future of IndyCar. Well, if you have anything to do with it, there'll be more people saying, wow, let's go to this, let's go see this. Good. That's what I do this for. I want people to understand. This is the greatest, as you and I were talking before we started, to win a championship in IndyCar, you've got to be good on a big oval, a small oval, I mean small, three quarter, less than three quarters of a mile. Street courses, road courses, permanent road, I mean, you've got to be able to drive them all and be consistent to win the championship. And that's, I don't think there's a better drivers in the world than the ones that win the championship. I would agree with you. What's next? Uh, we're going to poke. Well, actually, tomorrow I leave uh, at 6 a.m. to go to Iowa to continue testing with the uh, the 18 car, um, we just plan to put it through its paces there and ensure that uh, we haven't screwed up anything there because that was a great race this year. Um, we don't think we should have, but uh, we've got we to gotta make sure we cross all our T's and dot the I's. And then uh, next weekend, we're off to Pocono. We're very excited you know, going there. I think it's a great racetrack. Uh, I, th I really love racing there. And then uh, two weeks after that, we got Gateway, and then we wind down in September with um, Watkins Glen and Sonoma. Fun stuff, ain't it? It's great stuff. I have heard in the past that uh, you are a perfectionist. And, of course, if you're going to win in these, this kind of uh, competition, you've got to be. You've got to say, this is what we need, and it can't be, unless, of course, you test, say, well, we make a move. But when you want something, you try and get the very best out of anything that you can because that's what makes the car go faster. 
Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, you're talking about hundreds of inches that make a huge difference, whether it's a, a toe setting for a tire or a ride height uh, setting. I mean, it's so critical um, that you get all those, se those settings uh, correct because you can either win the race or be out of the ballpark just like that. Well, the interesting thing, usually in a top 12 or 15 qualifying, whether it's a street road or, or an oval, they're until top 15 or, or probably three quarters of a second apart. And that's just a smattering of inches. And it's, it goes for the driver too. You know, if he inhales or exhales at the wrong point, you know, he can blow a couple tenths of a second just like that. Well, I appreciate you taking the time. I would say I'm sorry that I bugged you, but I'm not. It's no problem. My pleasure. <laughs> I, I have found if somebody doesn't want me to ask them, they'll tell me to shut up. And if you don't, I'm still going. There you go. Well, well it's great my job pleasure. to you and your your team. You put, I think is a a, delish, a a fabulous car. If you haven't seen it, you need to see it somewhere along the way, because it is a slick looking car, and it performed to what you said that you wanted it to do. And in fact, I think you were looking for two nineteens, and you got just a little tad over two twenty. So you you had to uh, tip a soda or two over that. Yeah, we're very proud of how it's performed so far. We love the way it looks, and hopefully, it excites people to come out and see it. I'll be there. Perfect. Thanks. That's all you need. Me, yeah. right? There Thank you, go. you very much. Yes, Appreciate sir. your time and uh, great job. Thank you. The, vi the Vice President of Competition and Race Engineering for the IndyCar Series, Mr. Bill Pappas. Thank you. Thanks. Now, I'm going to make a quick call because I see my second guest hasn't showed up yet. I don't know if he's in the restaurant looking for his f food. Exactly. I don't know. Thanks. Yeah, we could be running out of gas. I hadn't thought of that. So I'm going to give him a quick buzz. Here he is. I'm mean, not here he is, but here he is. I'll call him and see if his girlfriend shut the door on him. Let's see what happens. Oh, one ringy dingy. This is like kind of the afternoon movie, isn't it? Two ringy dingies. Three ringy dingies. Oh, this doesn't sound good. I wonder if he got pulled over. <laughs> four, four. <laughs> Hi, Connor. Hi, Connor. This is Don. I'm waiting. We're waiting. There are fans and fannies here just to see you. So uh, at your earliest convenience, call me or walk through the front door. We're waiting. Oh, well. Well, listen, I, no, I won't sing and dance. Um, I don't think that's necessary. What, are you turning the camera off? Oh, boy. Don't forget, folks, there are tours of the Speedway bus tours, and one of the, in fact, the only female tour guide is sitting right here. If you want to ride, look at that. Let me tell you, when you get in the bus with her, you won't care what she's talking about. So, and you need to take a tour of the museum. You've got to see the Foyt exhibit. It's fabulous. That lovely blonde will take care of you, get you in the gate aim you in the right direction and get out of your way. So be sure and stop in. Um, let me mention that the portion of this Autosport.com 2017 show is presented by Sam Pierce Chevrolet in Daleville, Indiana. Come to see why the best prices in the country are in fact in the country at Daleville. And Sam doesn't stand behind you when he sells you a car, he stands alongside you. He is the best, and you'll find out why his customer service ratings are top. Take I-69 North to exit 35 and south one mile. You won't miss him. You want to find out what these guys and gals like about driving Indy cars? Why don't you take a ride in the Indy Racing Experience two-seater, home of the greatest ride in America. You can call, make a reservation, or go online to IndyRacingExperience.com, pick out a date that works for you. And uh, call 317-243-7171. Ask for Shonda at extension 106. 
Or if you don't do it online, put SJ1 in the promo box and you get a 50% discount. So you want to see what riding in an Indy car is like? Try it. You will love it. Do you need insurance for your home, your car, or you have a commercial building? You need insurance? Go and see the people that I see you. Seen Mike Pardee at VP Insurance. Mike handles AAA among others, and he can insure your home and your car with no problem and save you money. Let him give you an, a, a quote. You might be surprised. He is located at 5004 West 16th Street in Speedway. His number is 317 248 0070. That's Mike Pardee at VP Insurance, 317 248 0070. And if you're, are, are you a vintage car buff? If you are, you need to subscribe to the Vintage Racing Quarterly. Go to svra.com and uh, subscribe to Vintage Racing Quarterly. And if you're into the Trans Am Series, which incidentally, Tony Perella just brought, bought controlling interest in Trans Am. So it will start to grow rapidly. They have a Trans Am magazine. It's fabulous. So go to svra.com and subscribe to both the Vintage Racing Quarterly and the Trans Am today. You'll be glad you did. Do you need some embroidery done for anything and everything? Then you gotta see stitches too. Fran will be glad to take care of you. If you can throw it, kick it, drop it, mail it, what, however you get it there, she can take care of it. Give her a call. Tell her what you need and she will take care of you. Number 317-271-3444. And next up for the SVRA will be the uh, 2017 U.S. Vintage Grand Prix presented by Jaguar. That's September 6th through the 10th at Watkins Glen International in Watkins Glen, New York. So if you want to see some great vehicles, great cars, great racing, check it out. The 2017 U.S. Vintage Grand Prix presented by Jaguar, September 6th through the 10th, Watkins Glen International. And... One of the upcoming, or the upcoming event at the Speedway, of course, is going to be the Red Bull Air Race. If you want to put a group together, have a party for the race, why not call Tony Meyer? She can help you organize it all. You can contact her at 317-515-7929. That's Tony Meyer, 317-515-7929. All right, I've done that. And everybody's hovering, hovering around the door. I think if he does show up, he's going to get pounced upon. <laughs> I'm getting a little nervous because Howdy Bell's going like this. I don't know if he's going to flap his wings or faint. I, I, I don't know. I texted him yesterday. He said he'd be here. Now, it couldn't be that a young lady took over. That couldn't happen. Could it? Or maybe an old lady. I don't know. Anybody got any comments about the new car, the, uh, the series, what's going on, what you'd like to see go on? Like to speak about something? Everybody runs their mouth until I say that, and all of a sudden there's a dead silence. Jeez. About what? Hamburgers? Oh, boy. Katie, they want you to come up here. Oh, that's disgusting. That's disgusting. Well, there's still somebody at the door. I don't know who that is. Well, Pocono, next up, the Tricky Triangle. Interesting place. I was at the first race they ran there. Um, I forget what it was. Uh, it's a very interesting track. They, we visited out there, I don't know, seven, eight years ago, and I asked the owner... Are you guys interested in IndyCar? Absolutely. Absolutely we are. Uh, so he said, we've got to resurface the track, then we'll do it. And by golly, I got back and I sent him a note that, that uh, Pocono's interested, and before you knew it, they had resurfaced the track, and the things are going on. Hopefully it will be a big crowd. The uh, Classic Times Racing Series will be there. Uh, with their vintage cars, and they're expecting a very good turnout this time, so that should be interesting to see that, plus the Indy cars, of course. And uh, I am unfortunately unable to go to the 
Pocono race, I can't hobble fast enough to get there even if I started today. <laughs> However, things will get better as, as I get older, or younger, I hope. Um, why don't you come, come, here, come on up here, Marty. Come on, let's, let's talk about AJ. Let's talk about AJ. You, you know AJ, don't you? I want you to know that we are being graced by a Las Vegas talent. She's bright and shiny, always got a smile. She's the only female tour guide at the Speedway, bobbling along. <laughs> and as I said, when you get in the bus and she's there, nobody pays a hell of a lot of attention to what she says. Her name is Phyllis Reynolds. Hello, Phyllis. Hello, Uncle Don. Thank you, guys. Hopefully, Connor will appear shortly, but until he does, I'll fill in for him. You're doing very well. Thank you. I like sitting here looking at you. He ain't that cute. He's cute, though. Oh, okay. <laughs> How in the world did you get involved in racing and at the Speedway? Uh, my first race was 1973. I was 17 with a huge crush on Mario Se Andretti. 73. If you ever see the 1976 Indy 500 yearbook, I'm on one of the cover pages. It's a classic. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. With a, with a wife beater that says Andretti that we put together with a Sharpie marker outside the sports spot because we didn't have the money to get it printed. So we took a Sharpie and wrote Andretti on a shirt. But he liked it, and it made the cover of the 500-year book. You'll do anything for publicity. That's true. You? That's so true. So what, what brought you back here? Did Marty say, help, I need help? She did. She did. Actually, no. Um, I had to bug them for two years to get that job. Did she give you a test? Actually, I don't know if you guys know Greta Allen or when Miss Mary was running the tour program. They interviewed me for two years, but I had too many other jobs. So I had to promise them to get rid of all those other jobs and give the Speedway first choice of schedule, which we still do today. Yeah, but I hate to say this to anybody, but if, if you ever go to a, 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 what do you call it, a display? Well, like an event? Well, where, where uh, construction stuff is displayed and there's an Anderson window display. Right, I'm the brand ambassador for Anderson Windows also, but we won't tell the Speedway that. Uh, somebody told me there uh, that they heard that, that, but they weren't sure. Correct. And then you do television spots and radio spots. Correct. They've seen some of those, but they're okay with those. Oh, yeah? Which ones have you done recently? Actually, I just shot um, a video two weeks ago for Junior Achievement for middle schools and elementary schools. So that was the latest one, but I'm not sure that'll be, that'll probably be internal. Thank you, awesome, awesome. You've done a, you've done a lot of that. I was surprised, because one day I, I, I saw you in something, I forget, what, it was a casino, I think. Right, I Indiana said, Grand and her. Hoosier I Park. I know her, <laughs> Right. Oh my goodness. How did you get into modeling? I've been acting for a long time. I went to the American Academy of Dramatic Arts in New York and got my union cards back here in Indiana and then did Off-Broadway, did a soap for two years, went to L.A. If I got every film I auditioned for, I would have an awesome resume, but I didn't. But still, it's been good. It's fun, isn't it? Yeah, it's awesome. Do, do, you know, you, you see people, and I don't know how true it is, that they're sitting, it's an audition. Are you nervous? Yes. Yeah. Did you get nervous? Not at all. I love auditioning because there's something competitive about it, which is awesome because you see the other actors and you know everybody's good, but you want to be the best. So there's some competition in it too. How many films did you get to pass the audition in? Um, I got really close. You guys remember Rain Man? Yeah. Top five for that. Didn't get it. Shawshank Redemption. Top two for that. Didn't get it. So my resume would be awesome if I got all those. And I have a feeling if you'd gotten some of those, you wouldn't be here talking to us anyway. I don't know, though. The Indianapolis Motor Speedway, really? you got to come back for that. I understand you have a favorite race team. Absolutely. If you guys know me, you will hear me blithering about Ganassi constantly. 
We have heard you blithering. Yeah, I know. I know. I know. Does Ganassi Racing know you blither? They do. Hopefully they approve of it, but yes, they know. I see. Do they send any of their people out to take a bus ride with you? Not yet, but hopefully. Well, actually, no. I did. Um, I was the host for Chip's WEC team back in the winter. So, yeah, ho at least I got to host them. Was Chip there? He was not, unfortunately. Boo. I know, right? Boo. What's your attraction to racing? The drivers or just the competition, just the whole thing? I think it's the spectacle. But then again, it goes way deeper than that. There's something that either speaks to you about a sport or it doesn't. And the minute I, I started wanting to come to the Indianapolis 500 since I was like 10, it just it sang to me and it still does today. And I know all you guys feel that same. I know you do or you wouldn't be here, right? Exactly. Okay. Exactly. I know Carl's sitting there saying, well, yeah. Maybe. <laughs> right. Yeah. What'd she say? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, what is your primary task at the museum other than getting out of Marty's way? Exactly. Well, I'm the only female tour guide at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, which is an honor in itself. But so Mike Smith runs tours. Marty Gray runs the museum. I'm sort of the bridge between both departments. So just whatever needs to be done, I'm your girl. I'll do it. I think Marty needs somebody to keep Mike away from her, actually. Mike is a handful. You guys know him? He's a handful. <laughs> yes. Yes. He acts up quite a bit. Does he really? He sure does. He gets out of hand. At every day. Oh, I see. Mm-hmm. Now, there's a Cracker Jack upstairs by the name of Dave Wilson. Do you oh ever Lord. see him? I see Mr. Wilson every day. Mr. Wilson comes in with four, like, huge Diet Cokes from McDonald's. You know those? Oh. He comes in every morning with four of those. That's just to, to start him. Start him, or does he give them to you ladies? He doesn't share with any of us. What a tight wad. I, I'm telling you. I think I'll call him tomorrow and complain. Right? Or maybe we can put some Diet Cokes on his tab. <laughs> Sweet. Oh, there's an idea. You know what would be good with that? Send up a dozen uh, White Castle. Well, I bet yeah. That'd, be, that'd go really good. It sure would. I know where he'd spend a lot of the morning. There you go. <laughs> oh, well. It has... has uh, Life in Indianapolis been, you know, after being in New York and going to school and going out to California, and, well, is Indianapolis the place to be? It absolutely is. Indianapolis is the best kept secret ever. Like other cities don't really know how cool we are. So if we want to kind of keep that hushed, it's okay. Because what we have is special and it's awesome. And it's, this vibe is nowhere else, but we've got it. We want to keep it. Absolutely. We got it. We got it. I don't think there's room in my pocket for it, but oh well. It'll fit. Okay. Okay. You know, it, it is an interesting city, and of course, I think one of the, besides the Pan Am games that I mentioned earlier and some of the other things they've done, I think the Super Bowl probably is the best one that's ever been held because everything you could get to, most of them you got to get a bus ride to go out to some of the events. Where here, it was all right there. Right, because we have the infrastructure, and the cool thing is most of that team is now I, on our IMS team. We have Allison Melangdon, of course, Mark Miles. So all the masterminds behind that, we have them. Do Can't beat it. Do they tell you what to do? From a distance. Actually, Marty tells me what to do. <laughs> but I bet that's not from a distance. No, that's from right there. <laughs> does she ever tell you to sit down and shut up? Yeah, actually, yes, oh. she does, yes. But she does it very gracefully. Oh, yeah. Mike Smith, on the other hand, no grace. Huh. Uh, oh, <laughs> awesome. <laughs> you, know, you, know that, you know that picture that's sitting there? You got it. Um, you know, it, it's kind of interesting, the people that come to the museum. And when you stand there and watch, there's a lot of foreigners that go through there that know this place and know what it is. It's amazing. We have huge world maps now, and we just got them in the spring. We already had to change out the first one and get a bigger one because you know how you put a pin where you're from? We actually have two from North Korea, although we doubt that the accuracy of that. We have, a, like, anywhere, any country you can name, I don't think we've missed any. And that's only been since, like, May or June. Incredible. If I wanted to take a ride with you, do I have to make a reservation? For you, Uncle Don, no reservation is needed. However, However we've been super you busy. Will, you will go to the end of the line. Oh, absolutely. Of course. 
we, we recommend reservations just for grounds tours because we only do four per day. And we've been incredibly busy for some random reason, but for Uncle Don, yeah, we'll make an exception. Sure. If you believe that, I've got a pond with a, right? a lot of fish in it. I'll sell you. A bridge in Arizona, right? Yeah, okay. <laughs> too. Well, I guess my friend Mr. Uh, Connor Daly isn't going to be here. That's just a wild guess on my part. He said, yesterday I'll see you. I, I guess I should have been more specific. See you when. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Oh, well. It's happened. It's only, this is only the second time that this has happened. And fortunately for me, you were here. No problem. And uh, everyone will probably want your autograph now. No, pr yeah, I'm right. <laughs> but no problem if you do. Thank you. Thank you. And I also think they'll probably want to talk to you about a discount on Anderson Windows. Exactly. As a matter of fact, we have one. Come oh. see us at the State Fair. Are you out there? Oh, yeah. Yes, yeah, starting Thursday. Well, how come you're not there now? They open Saturday. Or because we have other reps that are working it. And I was on the schedule for Miss Marty right there, so. And she overrides Anderson? I told you. When they hired me, I had to give all the other jobs up. Oh, boy. Yep. Why don't you tell me when you skip, I can take a couple. No problem. I bet it's, I bet it's more than six and a half, seven bucks an hour. A little bit more. Okay. Just a little bit more. Yeah. Oh, well, thanks for stopping by. I think uh, we'll have some visitors, and they're going to come. Where's Phyllis? We want to go for a ride. Exactly. You guys come in. Come on now. Because we always have something new on the tours, always something cool. If you haven't noticed, we got IMS to let us use their trams. So you're like right a couple of inches off the track. It's awesome. It's super personal, and people are loving it. Come and take a tram tour. Sure. And when it rains? It's a little wet, but it's still cool. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Phyllis Absolutely. Reynolds. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Motor Speedway Museum. I don't know what. Two of my, two of my guests? Which two? And was she impressed? Good heavens. I hope he changed his shirt since then. He's Hawaiian. Well, yeah, he didn't care. I see. Were you there, Steve? Wow, Steve made it. Wow. How was it? I'd go back. What a guy. What a guy. And you're going to wear your eyes out shirt? Oh, boy. All right. Well, unfortunately, I guess we're going to shut off just, well, not much early. I apologize for Mr. Connor Daly. I will discuss it with him and see when we can get him in here because he had some visitors that wanted to see him specifically. And I'm sure I'm going to get barked at for that, but it wasn't me. Next week we will be back, hopefully not hobbling quite as bad. Uh, I have a couple of guests online, but I'll put them up on autosportradio.com. Just hit the uh, autosport show tab and you'll see who they are. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll find out what he's doing. But thanks for being here. Thanks for watching. Thanks for uh, Ted for helping me out, getting this thing going, and uh, Brett for putting this t TV together and the sound. Until next week, Don K. saying thanks for being here. Thanks for watching and listening. We'll see you next week. Good night.